Now I'm sure we all know what nitinol is, but just in case, it's an alloy of two metals, nickel and titanium, in a ratio of 50-50. Although they have played around with that a bit, and you get things like nitinol, nitinol 55 and nitinol 60, which represents a change in the proportion of the alloys. But nitinol exhibits something called shape memory. It's quite astonishing because you can bend it when it's cold, and if you put it in something warm, even hot water from the tap, it will spring straight back out into shape that it originally had. And it does that with considerable force. It's something like 55 tonnes per square inch or something like that. It's a very forceful material. Now, it's named after the place it was discovered. So, nitinol stands for Nickel Titanium National Ordnance Laboratory, and that's where it was developed in 1959. And they looked at it for um, the cones of torpedoes. They wanted a stronger material for torpedoes. But they didn't actually notice the shape memory effect until they took it into a business meeting, and one of the managing directors took his pipe lighter out waved it over the cone and it popped back into shape. And you can imagine them sitting in that meeting as that happened because the, the way nitinol pops back into shape is very dramatic. So it must have been quite dramatic to see that. Now that happened in 1961. Between then and 1973, not a lot happened to it. The reason not a lot happened to it is because it's um, fiendishly difficult to actually make in large lumps. Small bits, dead easy, large lumps, quite problematic. And it wasn't until around about then that they overcome the technical challenges of actually bulk making nitinol. Once they bulk made it, then they were able to experiment with this shape change and the force that this shape change could actually uh, create. Now, nitinol wasn't the first shape memory alloy. There were uh, lots of shape memory alloys, and it goes back into 1932 when you're looking at things like uh, gold and cadmium, iron and palladium, uh, copper and zinc, which is just brass, was actually uh, recognised as a shape mem memory alloy, and copper, aluminium and nickel, which is another actual sold shape memory alloy. It's cheaper and not quite as forceful as nitinol, but it is out there and it can do that job. So it's been known for a very long time. But it wasn't until 1973 when an engine was made out of it. And this engine was called the Banks engine. And if you have a look at the Banks engine, and you'll see that it's not really the force of the nitinol that's being used. What's happening is that the nitinol is being forced to straighten out, and that changes the centre of gravity on the wheel, and that causes the wheel to turn. It's very similar, if you think about it, to things like the rubber band engine and the daisy engine that we made in previous videos. So, what this is suggesting is that shape memory isn't only a property of metals. Actually, you get shape memory in a surprising list of materials, including uh, plastics. Plastics will exhibit shape memory. And this has been used for things like the Daisy engine and a drum engine that works off um, solar. And there is another plastic that has shape memory, and it's this stuff, ordinary 3D printing PLA. Incidentally, ABS does not have shape memory, but PLA does. And if I take a section of PLA and force it into a shape while it's cold, like, say, a coil, it will remember it's straight shape, and if I dip that in warm water, it'll bring back that shape. So if we take our bit of curled up PLA and dip it into some hot water, <laughs> it will recover its shape. It's very cool, and you might think that it's just, well, the water's warm, the plastic gets soft, and it's gravity. But if I print off a spring shape and force that spring out, into a straight shape like that and put that in warm water. Take our bit of straightened out. <laughs> now at first sight, two little bits of filament that can change their shape in hot water may not seem like a very big deal, but actually the fact that it's PLA and it is universally the most used 3D printer filament opens up actually an exciting world of possibility in 3D printing. PLA has already been heavily investigated for a whole range of applications like medical stents. NASA are looking at this because if you damage a wheel, say, 
then if you heat it, it will pop straight back into shape. And if you're making something where you're using compound curves or, you, or your programming is restricted so you can't form complex surfaces, then heating this material and draping it over a former will be able to create that material for you. Equally, you can use its shape changing ability to do some pretty surprising things. Of course, my own particular bent is in engines and solar. And if I can 3D print a solar engine that will remember a shape and use the heat of the sun to turn it, that's the kind of thing that I'm going to be interested in. The Nitino was given over to McDonnell Douglas in 1980 to see what they could do with it. And instead of using that um, property of straightening out and changing gravity, what they did was use a Nitinol spring. And that Nitinol spring is very similar to the Nitinol kit engines that you can buy, that you see on Amazon and YouTube all over the place. And what happens is if you stretch out a, a piece of Nitinol spring and then put it into warm water, it will contract back again quite forcefully. And they use that to, dis to pull a pulley wheel, and that is what turns the actual pulley wheel, and it does it with considerable force. Now, the McDonald, en the McDonald Douglas engine was a series of these in line, all pulling on a pulley, and what they reckoned was they could build a 50, uh, 55 megawatt hour Nitinol engine. Now, they didn't build a 55 megawatt hour engine, they built a proof of concept to show that a 55 megawatt hour engine could be built, so it was a possibility. But given these marvellous properties and the fact that they're um, just so <laughs> exciting because they're solid state, you have to ask the question, well, why aren't they everywhere? Why aren't we using Nitinol engines right now? We have the technology, we have the why, we have the experimentation. Why aren't there power plants running from Nitinol engines? Well, there are obviously good reasons. For well, one of them is it's only about 16% efficient, so doing something with a direct heat drive on that would be really quite wasteful. What you really want, of course, is to scavenge heat from somewhere. Now, two-thirds of heat energy is actually wasted in the environment, a lot of that heat energy goes to do its work and then it's exhausted. So a Nittinel engine would only be any good as a way of scavenging heat from what would otherwise be exhausted heat. It's also very good for making work out of low thermal difference. So it can work up sort of 1800 degrees centigrade difference, something like that. So when you have low thermal temperature differences, Nittinel is actually quite good. But of course low thermal temperature differences aren't aggregated in the same way that high thermal temperature differences are. I mean, you get them, so you can get a difference in the sea and the temperature of the sea and temperature of lakes and temperature of the inside and the outside of a building and so on and so on. But they aren't as concentrated and prevalent as high thermal difference engines, things like nuclear and coal and gas, that sort of stuff. And so they're not finding as many applications as it was originally thought, and the efficiency of them is quite low, so they're not really being implemented in the same way. Now, I don't think that that's an issue in itself, because I think that energy and energy production is about having a strategy. So Nitinol as part of that strategy would certainly be very interesting, but Nitinol as a standalone solution has been found not particularly to work, because when the economics of it, of it are done, set against the 16% efficiency, it turns out Nitinol, although marvellous, because it has no moving parts, isn't really viable as a substitution for our energy generation as we make it now. Certainly not in terms of wind, when you think that they're 30% efficient, and in terms of solar, which is now pushing the 20% efficiency boundary. So the shape memory behavior of PLA could open up whole new worlds of possibilities in terms of low thermal difference engines, not only replicating the McDonnell Douglas engine. And if you are a person who's very much into your 3D printing and you're looking for a project, particularly with PLA and this memory behavior exhibits, I thought it would be a really interesting topic. It certainly interests me. And having done a couple of experiments on it, then I think I'd be looking at this a little bit deeper. So I thought I would share all of that with you. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. And please do remember to like and subscribe.